Good morning, everybody. We'll start in a moment. Investor made millions of dollars understanding market trends. Tens of thousands of people tuned to him to find out what he has to say. His latest expertise, he's bottled this, pandemic investing. It's actually, I think, called pandemic investment. Uh, we welcome Jason Hartman. Uh, I, By the way, just to be completely honest, I, I've kind of become a fan. I've been watching his videos, seeing what he has to say, even listen to his podcast a little bit. I want to tackle two things with you, Jason. First is, is there a looming crisis? Number two, what will be the big trend that comes out of this? Let's start with the crisis first. Nick, a great question. It's good to be here. And the circumstances in some ways are very dire. And the question when it comes to real estate is what type of real estate and where? There are three basic types of real estate markets in the entire world, linear, cyclical, and hybrid markets. The cyclical markets, meaning the expensive markets around the country, South Florida, close to where I live, the west coast of the United States, the expensive northeastern markets, they are in for trouble, especially if they are high density markets, because I predict, Rick, that there will be a mass migration away from high density markets to low density suburban markets. Mm -hmm. I think we are going to see a major rise, resurgence in suburban living. And I think, I guess, if I can fill in the rest of the uh uh, end the mine here. Uh, two reasons. A, people can work from home uh, because they right. don't want to be in elevators surrounded by other people. Right. And B, the new technology allows it to happen. Right. And, and the interesting thing about that, Rick, is that the technology isn't that new. We've, we've been able to do this for quite a while, as you know. Sure. But but now everybody's been forced to use Skype and Zoom and GoToMeeting and all these tools. A crisis always pushes people. You know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? And now many more people, you know, have been forced to work from home and they realize they can do it. So the home is becoming the center of the universe as it should be. The city is um, not as necessary as it used to be. I was listening to your podcast over the weekend as I was driving uh, from D.C. to Baltimore, and you were the most interesting thing to listen to at the time. And you kept saying <laughs> well, thank something. You. <laughs> you kept saying something, which was interesting. Well, there's no more sports. Uh, you kept saying, stay calm. The most important thing is stay yeah. calm. And yet, the things that you and I are talking about are not the kind of things that make people stay calm. How, how, how do you balance those two? That's a great question. There are a lot of people in it, you know, suffering. This too will pass. Will, will I lose my house? Will I lose my investments? Will I ever work again? These are the things people are thinking about. Maybe not you and I, but some of the folks watching us, uh, Jace. Understood, understood. Uh, unfortunately, we are galloping towards socialism. Uh, we are galloping toward a more centralized control of our lives. The government, the Federal Reserve are coming to the rescue. They have been bold i mean be unbelievably bold in, in the amount of money they they're pumping into the system there will be more this is an absolutely historic time helicopter money. truly incredible what's happening what, what, what yeah, you, helicopter what you, money helicopter money it just keeps coming you and got it. knows where it's, it's like it's like magical money right Yep, yep. It's, it's, hey, listen, when, when you have the reserve currency of the world and the biggest military in the world to make sure you keep it that way, you can, you can pretty much do what you want. And I, I know everybody says the dollar will collapse and so forth. Right now, the dollar has gained a lot of strength because everybody around the world is sucking up dollars in order to fulfill obligations and to buy commodities like gold. We are in uncharted territory. It's a very interesting time. So we're no like, question. We're, it's almost like we're in a button kicking contest and everybody else is out of two legs but at least we still have one right yeah, good point you know it's it's not that i agree philosophically with any of the stuff that's going on as i didn't during the last crisis but the u.s is the, is the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry as the same goes <laughs> well said you're a great guest jason thanks so much we appreciate having you on my name is jeremy i'm a big supporter of jason hartman uh, and grateful to jason for a lot of what i've learned over the last four years I can attest to him. Um, we've had some good success using the strategies, being a little more conservative on some of the decisions. So we've purchased a couple of properties through the Creating Wealth Network, through Jason's network, uh, and done some new construction stuff on the side as well. 
and uh, and just really feel like I owe a lot to Jason and the team for the education part, uh, and sometimes the motivation too to just go ahead and jump in and and get active and do things. You learn a lot more by doing than by learning uh, by podcast or any other way. Um, I've attended several seminars and I've enjoyed all of those. I attended the Mastermind Group once and really enjoyed that as well. Uh, big supporter, grateful to Jason again. Thanks. We've been listening to Jason's podcast for a couple years now. And the main reason we came is to determine which market we want to buy next. It's been really helpful to talk to um, some of the various people in different areas, to network. We've learned some good information about taxes and loans. And I definitely recommend it and would for sure come back. Hi, my name is Hayato Nagishi. I'm from New York City, and uh, it's been a great seminar, been a great two days. Uh, what I've learned over here that I did not know about are land contracts. Um, I know about traditional income, cash flow, property investing, but land contracts are something totally new, and um, I wanted to thank Jason and his team for bringing it to the table here, um, and uh, hopefully I can uh, have uh, other alternative options to invest. Thank you. Well, I'm a longtime listener to the podcast, of course, and uh, I, I like the approach to the business. I love the, the website that uh, Jason Hartman has, and uh, we're definitely looking to uh, extend our real estate education. Of course, that's my main piece. And we're looking to invest in properties, start taking action, and, and get, some, uh, get some properties uh, working for my post-federal government uh, career. Just in general, looking at the uh, talking to the fellow uh, fellow investors here and talking to Jason, a lot of what Jason has talked about, uh, I've I've heard on the, on his own podcast or whatever, but uh, but I think it's fascinating. I'm I'm curiously scribbling notes uh, in my notebook as the as the days go on here. Uh, I listen. Uh, I want to learn lessons. I want to learn how to uh, avoid the pain of the mistakes in real estate and uh, and the ways that you can invest and make a good long term income. Today, we talked about commandment number three last time, thou shalt maintain control, be a direct investor. We talked about the importance of that. Today, let's go on and let's talk about commandment number four, okay? Now, commandment number four is uh, something that's kind of affiliated with the crooks on Wall Street, <laughs> right? Uh, so I, I always say Wall Street is the modern version of organized crime, uh, and um, but they do have some very good things. There's some obviously extremely brilliant people on Wall Street, the quants, right? The, the people that really, really know their stuff. Uh, literally, rocket scientists, okay? If you saw the movie Margin Call, which is a great movie, by the way, uh, you know, the, the guy uh, says, um, uh, he, he was being asked by one of his superiors, he says, hey, hey, kid, you know, this brilliant kid is in there analyzing the financial pools and all this kind of stuff, and he says, hey, you know, what did, what, what's your major? What's your background? And he says, well, I went to college to be a rocket scientist. Quite literally, and uh, and but you end up on Wall Street because that's where the money is, right? And so uh, we see all of this kind of stuff, right? But one of the things Wall Street does pretty well is they they utilize the art and science of financial planning. Now, financial planning in and of itself is a fantastic art and science, right? You know, when you're when you invest in something before you get started as an investor, or if you're already moving along, maybe you want to just take a step back and look at the big picture, right? Look at the big picture. And in doing that, when it comes to financial planning, you need to consider uh, your investment goals, your risk tolerance. You know, there are some people that are uh, very risk averse, very conservative, right? They want to just preserve, preserve, preserve. And that person might want to diversify more. You know, there's an old saying, diversification perpetuates wealth and concentration creates wealth, right? So it depends what phase of your life you're in. You know, if you've already made your money and maybe you're a little older, you want to just preserve and, you know, and, and perpetuate. Uh, but if you're younger and you haven't made your money yet, maybe you've got to take some bigger risk and you've got, you want to concentrate. Um, there, there are two old sayings that come to mind uh, in this vein. One is the one we've all heard. Uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Well, there's another saying, and I believe it was Andrew Carnegie who said this. He said, and, and I don't think, by the way, either of these are right or wrong. I just think they should both be considered, and it depends on the situation, right? But Andrew Carnegie, I think it was, who said, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket, okay? So concentration. Now, with income property, the most historically proven asset class in the entire world, we can have the best of both worlds. 
we can put all our eggs in the one basket of the income property asset class, but we can diversify geographically because there's an old saying in real estate, all real estate is local. And we'll talk about this on a future video because that's actually another commandment. Okay, so we'll get to that. But financial planning techniques. So understand your risk tolerance, understand your time horizon, understand your investment goals, right? Uh, are you investing for cash flow, income, capital appreciation, uh, asset protection, diversification, back to the other thing? You know, what is the point? What is the goal of your investment, right? If you are a cash flow investor, you will naturally be a more conservative investor, right? This is in, in the stock market comparison, this would be a, a dividend investor versus a capital appreciation investor that invests in the type of real estate market that is a likely to appreciate. And I think that's pretty much being a gambler, okay? I don't think that's being an investor. That's a, a speculation move, right? And we'll talk about uh, on a future video, the three types of real estate markets, linear, cyclical, and hybrid. And depending on your risk tolerance and what you've discovered from thinking about financial planning, we will talk about uh, what type of market you want to invest in. So we'll get to that on a future video. And uh, thank you for joining me today. What do you think about this? Go to jasonhartman.com slash ask or leave a comment below. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the next video. Until then, happy investing. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants, and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. Actions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Hey, everybody. Good morning to all. How's everybody doing? Hope all is well. Uh, drop a comment. I got a lot of comments already and some good questions and uh, things. So thank you for those. Keep coming, keep them coming and uh, drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from or listening from. We always like to uh, have a sense of geography. I say that that's, you know, one of the really important things is uh, having a sense of geography. And what I've uh, been saying since 2012, uh, interestingly, even though, <laughs> you know, this kind of seems like it contradicts that, right, is that geography is less meaningful than it's ever been in human history. Geography is less meaningful than it's ever been in human history. Now, why would I say that? Well, when I said it back in 2012, it was uh, due to the self-driving car, autonomous vehicles changing uh, so much of the world. And, and you know, that's coming, but it's, I, I kind of thought it would be here faster uh, when I bought a Tesla back in, what was that, 2015 or 16? Um, by the way, I do not recommend Tesla. Uh, I own two of them. I had a Tesla Model S and a Tesla Model X. And the Model S was all right, but the Model X was an absolute piece of junk. Oh, that was a terrible car. Wow, what a piece of junk. Um, in fact, it was such a piece of junk that uh, they actually refunded my money <laughs> after arguing with Tesla all that time. But ah, I'm already on a tangent. It's too early to be on a tangent. Okay. Okay. Um, the reason I say that is because, you know, I, I bought that car, well, both of them, because uh, I was super excited about autonomous vehicles, about self-driving cars. And I thought, you know, that's going to change everything. It has such wide ranging impacts for real estate investors, because think about it, the three primary value drivers since the beginning of time, since the beginning of time for real estate have always been what? You know what I'm going to say? Location, location, and location, right? Those are the three most important things about real estate. And I agree with that until autonomous vehicles and until civil unrest and riots by idiots who don't even know what they're protesting about, uh, the destroyers, the people who destroy the world and 
you know, there are other people that create value and there, there are those who leech off value created by value creators. And then there are people who absolutely destroy value. And, you know, yes, uh, you losers and looters in Portland, Seattle, Philadelphia, uh, Minnesota, Minnesota, <laughs> I guess Minneapolis more specifically, uh, in Missouri, you know, wherever you are, that's you. Okay. Those people are scum. Okay. Uh, now I don't mind the idea of protesting. If there's a legitimate thing to protest about, I love the first amendment. That's what it's for to allow people to peaceably assemble, peaceably assemble and redress their government. Uh, and that's great, but that's not what's happening, uh, sadly. So, you know, the cities, the urban areas, the best locations historically, New York City, San Francisco, LA, you know, these uh, these now shitholes, okay? Um, oh, maybe I should bleep myself. These, uh, here, let's do it again. Let's do it again. These, uh, these shitholes. <laughs> okay, so uh, there we go. I, don't, I need a bleep sound. I don't have a bleep sound on here, do I? Let's see. Um, no, no bleep. I need a bleep sound. Anybody have a bleep sound? We need that. So uh, those were the great locations and the expensive locations. And you could see why the value of real estate was higher in those areas because that's where the jobs were. And wherever people had you know, a high density environment, population density was a big driver of real estate prices, right? You know, supply and demand, more people wanted to live there. They're going to push the price up for a limited housing stock. Uh, and then, um, and then high paying jobs, that was always important, but now we've obviously seen all of that change. So, um, location is less meaningful than it's ever been in human history. And I say that meaning that the prior idea of location value drivers uh, is less meaningful. Location is still very meaningful because now people want to move to the suburbs and that's the new valuable location, whereas the prior valuable location for a long, long time, ever since the Industrial Revolution, was the cities. And if you think about it way back to the time when we were living in caves, uh, you know, the location of your cave was mighty important, wasn't it? Uh, you know, were you close to water? Were you close to food? Were you living in a in a cave that had good protection? You know, maybe it was up on a hill and it made it harder for predators, whether they be other humans or uh, or animals, to get to you. It was a defensible location. So uh, location, again, uh, the, the idea of value of a location is definitely, definitely changing. Okay, so we are also changing the time of the show. Remember last week I announced that I wanted my Sunday mornings back? I want my Sunday mornings back. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't think this is the ideal time, actually, uh, for ratings either. Because, uh, you know, a lot of you are uh, going to church or you're, uh, you know, you're not up yet. You're not up and awake yet, so uh, we're going to do this on Sunday afternoon evenings, depending on your time zone, depending on your time zone. So our new time is every Sunday, 4 o'clock Pacific. For those of you living in the high-tax, landlord-unfriendly state of California with almost 40 million people, but dwindling, um, hopefully you will move soon and I can help you move. I can teach you how to move because I did it nine years ago and I highly recommend it. Um, but if you're in California, the Socialist Republic or the Socialist Republic of Oregon or the Socialist Republic now of Washington State, Washington State, I don't know, not exactly. It's more like Seattle, but the rest of the state, you know, Washington is a no income tax state. So they got they got something going for them. And certainly the Pacific Northwest is a beautiful place when it's not raining, <laughs> when it's not raining. But hey, anyway, if you're in the Pacific time zone, four o'clock every Sunday afternoon. And if you're on the East Coast in the Socialist Republic of New York or the Socialist Republic of Taxachusetts or the uh, Socialist Republic of Washington, D.C., the belly of the beast <laughs> or anywhere on the East, 7 p.m. And if you're in the middle, just figure it out. OK, you can do the math on the time zone. You know, there was a, a politician years ago that wanted to split the country up into just two time zones. 
And I thought that was a fantastic idea. I mean, uh, every time you fly west to east, you lose the whole day. And uh, it really makes it harder to do business. Now, that doesn't change the way the sun sets, obviously. But, you know, anyway, didn't happen. But one thing we definitely got to get rid of is we've got to follow the Arizona plan. When I lived in Arizona for six years, I loved it because they didn't change their clocks. That was the smartest thing of all, not to change the time. That's absolutely crazy time change stuff. Okay. Hey, uh, so hopefully you have commented with your location. Let's uh, just before we jump into some content, let's do a few questions. Rob says the, oh, this is a good metaphor. The Chicagoization of California has begun. I would actually say it's the Illinoisation. Illin Illinoisation? Maybe Illinoisation. Um, yeah, sadly, it, it has. Uh, or, or it's the Detroitization. The Detroitization. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, what does John say? They are using people now. I don't, I think you're talking about Wall Street here, John, because on the video, the intro video, I talked about Wall Street being the modern version of organized crime. Wall Street is a epic scam. Epic scam it is. Um, and we're going to talk about that today a little more. But they're using people as money to enrich themselves. And uh, you think it would be uh, would be for love and morality. Well, I don't know. Now are you talking about tech companies or what are you talking about? I'm not quite sure. So, John, uh, add another comment and um, and give us a comment. Now, I saw this one earlier and I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you talking to here? What planet are you living on? No, we have to go back to a gold-based currency. We're going to talk about inflation today, so that's a good topic. Um, using people as currency is both evil and not humane. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. I think you're talking about the tech companies. Remember, when, when the product is free, remember, you are the product, okay? And that's the way these tech companies have been using billions of us uh, for way too long. Rob says, this too will pass. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's due to my comment on RT television with uh, Rick Sanchez. Yes, this too will pass. Now, what's interesting about that, I really need to put the date. I need to have our video editor go in and put the date on that because that interview, I think, was back in March, that first interview you saw on the video this morning. Um, and it will pass like a kidney stone, yes. <laughs> it's it's not easy, No, no question about it. We're going to have, I think significant asset inflation. Well, we've had it already. What am I saying? Going to have, we've already had it. And uh, so we'll, we'll get into that more. Uh, Jason, just a comment on when you start the podcast, it would be nice to announce the date. Uh, yes, absolutely. The, uh, you're talking about our Flashback Friday podcast. So on the Creating Wealth podcast, that's the little logo image you see up here, the Creating Wealth podcast. Um, we do not announce the date it originally aired on Flashback Friday, but we do, Wookie, uh, put it in the show notes. It's in the show notes for every episode. So all you have to do is just click on the show notes and you'll see the original episode number and date it aired. Okay, so I hope that helps. Yes, it would be nice to put the date in the audio. It's a little bit more of a production headache to do that. Um, uh, and we'll think about it. So thank you for the request. It, it's a good idea. But it's right there in the show notes for you, okay? Uh, have a perspective on what, yes, for that's Flashback Friday, absolutely, it, it does. Well, that's, you know, that's why I play those uh, Flashback Friday episodes because a couple of things on that. You know, number one, uh, if you, if you uh, subscribe to our, I don't want to say it too loud, but our Alexa skill, A-L-E-X-A, -A, I guess I can spell it, Alexa skill. If you subscribe to the Alexa skill, uh, then um, uh, you will get a lot of short, quick flashbacks that are, you know, four or five minutes long. And you can get that on your news briefing, which, by the way, is not just on your Amazon Echo device, but also available on your smartphone with the A-L-E-X-A -E app. OK, can't say it too loud because Jeff Bezos is bugging every conversation I have. It's a scary world we live in, folks. Hashtag 1984, which, by the way, uh, I said that George Orwell wrote that and I was mistaken. I said before he wrote that in 1948, probably my dyslexia showing. 
he actually wrote it in 1949. I looked that up yesterday. So great book, 1984, written back in 1949 by George Orwell. We are living in that world, sadly. And then also Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, and then uh, Fahrenheit 451. We're living in all these dystopian worlds. They've all come true. And then, of course, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. All, all of it is all of it is sadly true. Uh, so uh, Kevin's are in late stage capitalism and we'll see the dollar drop. Well, we're going to talk about how you can make a lot of money from that today, Kevin. So I think you'll like this. Uh, Barry says, are there still blanket mortgages? Yes, there are blanket mortgages. I think you asked that question last week. Barry, we're here for you. Just reach out. Go to jasonhartman.com. Fill out any contact form there. Our investment counselors will reach out to you with referrals to where you can get blanket mortgages. But some of you may be asking, what does Barry mean by a blanket mortgage? That just means one mortgage that uh, covers many, many properties. Okay, many properties. So you can buy 10 or 50 or 100 properties at jasonhartman.com slash properties subject to inventory availability, unfortunately, because inventory is pretty scarce right now. But we, we can get it for you. We can do it. Uh, and you can get one mortgage to finance all of those properties under one blanket. Okay, so that's good. Kevin says, much more crash is coming. Yes, I agree with you, Kevin. There's a lot of, uh, lot of stuff in the system we haven't seen yet. We'll keep talking about that. Much more protests coming to the U.S. Yes, more property destruction. So get out of those urban areas. I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. Okay, so uh, let's jump into a little content here. Check out uh, jasonhartman.com. Go to uh, call 1-800-HARTMAN on the telephone if you're in the United States, and uh, you can reach us and check out our legal stuff at jasonhartman.com. It's always good to say that just to keep those lawyers happy. All right, so the world is binging on debt. And it is breaking records, folks. Yes, this is from the Wall Street Journal. And uh, this is mind boggling. Let's see, what do we need for that? We need, we need this. It's maybe a drum roll. Lots of debt, lots of debt, folks. So look at this, companies and governments have issued a record 9.7 trillion, that's with a T, 9.7 trillion dollars of bonds and other debt instruments this year. That is absolutely staggering. And what does that mean to you? What does it mean to us, okay? As an extraordinary support, from the Federal Reserve and other central banks, these are these other central banks around the world, uh, you know, uh, the Bank of Japan, the ECB, the European Central Bank, all the other central banks. And they have just issued massive, massive amounts of debt. The total covers uh, the year to November 26th and includes 5.1 trillion of corporate bonds as well as some other kinds of loans, including riskier leveraged loans. Uh, this is absolutely unbelievable, folks. It, the, the amount of debt in the system, I mean, we thought it was absolutely crazy back in the 90s. We thought it was absolutely crazy uh, back during the Great Recession, you know, 2008 to 2010. We thought, oh my gosh, this, these debt levels are obscene. They're absolutely catastrophic. What do they mean for the future? What do they mean? Remember the tea parties? Um, uh, you know, those uh, peaceful uh, protests, uh, the tea parties where people didn't litter, where they cleaned up after themselves and, uh, you know, uh, got some media attention for the tea party versus Occupy Wall Street, which, by the way, um, conceptually I agreed with because Wall Street is a bunch of crooks and, um, I liked it, but the Occupy Wall Streeters were the same idiots that are like the, you know, same, uh, same general idiots that are protesting today. And, um, uh, you know, these are like, uh, it's like that James Dean movie, that old James Dean movie, Rebel Without a Cause. <laughs> you know, these people are so stupid that they, uh, 
they, they're just looking for some kind of cause. Uh, read Eric Hoffer's book, The True Believer. That's an old book, but it's really interesting about the psychology of mass movements. Uh, Eric Hoffer, The True Believer. Very interesting. Old book, like way back written in the 50s or 60s, probably. And um, uh, yeah, but the, the debt levels are absolutely insane. So uh, Tea Party. Oh, yeah. Where was I going with that? Yes. So I remember seeing one of these um, signs, you know, these picket signs that uh, someone had at a Tea Party rally, and they had their, their cute little kid holding it. And the cute little kid uh, had a sign that said, I was born with, you know, I don't remember the number, but like $87,000 in change of debt. And uh, that's basically the concept saying that every kid Every baby born in the United States comes with a, a price on their head, essentially. The amount of debt, uh, if you just divide the, you know, you take the amount of the debt and divide it by population, right? Um, then you get the amount of debt per person, the per capita debt, okay? And uh, it's absolutely staggering, folks. And the debt level, if you've ever, uh, by the way, you know, go to the like the look up the U.S. debt clock, the famous debt clock. Um, maybe I'll just bring that up and and we'll talk about it today, possibly, uh, if I can type and talk at the same time. You know, it's like walking and chewing gum at the same time. It's kind of hard to do both. Uh, no, just kidding. I can walk and chew gum at the same time, but typing and talking at the same time, that ain't so easy. Uh, so this the the debt clock. Uh, or the debt numbers, right? The per capita debt does not include the unfunded liabilities, the unfunded mandates that are coming at us. That only increases this number. It only increases it. So the debt can't be repaid through any conventional mechanism. Uh, it can't be repaid by raising taxes you couldn't raise enough tax. If you made the tax rate 150%, you couldn't solve the problem, okay? You know, meaning not only give all your money to the government, every penny you earn, but then owe them 50% more than you actually earn, right? If the tax level was 150%, you could not pay for the problem. The problem is so big, it's absolutely insane. Um, you, you can't pay for it uh, really any other way than inflating your way out of it. And I say that's the business plan that uh, the U.S. government has already been engaging in for many years and will continue to engage in because it's a very good deal for them. It's a very good deal for them. And what I want to help you do is I want to help you align your interest as an investor with the most powerful forces the human race has ever known, governments, and central banks, meaning the Federal Reserve and the other central banks around the world, because all of them have a very vested interest in inflation. So that's the business plan. I mean, it's it's not like a theory anymore. It's already here, and it's going to continue, and it's only going to get more and more pronounced, more and more pronounced. So when you look at fake book, right? Uh, remember uh, before the the pandemic. Uh, uh, or the scamdemic. <laughs> yeah, you can tell what I think about it. Um, so uh, before the scamdemic, the pandemic, the plandemic, um, uh, fake book was talking a lot about their Libra cryptocurrency. I like the name because I'm a Libra. I, that's the best sign in the Zodiac, folks. It's the only one not represented by an animal. I do love animals, but we are represented by the scales, the scales of justice, balance, homeostasis. That's the Libra sign, right? The scales. And uh, maybe that's why I'm so justice-oriented and why I'm uh, a consumer advocate, because uh, I really like that. You know, I, I grew up as a kid watching a lot of legal courtroom dramas, and I always wanted to be a judge or a lawyer, but I, I didn't want to ruin the world any more than it already was. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the legal system is really incredible. It is I'd say more than anything else, the legal system is the the cornerstone of civilization because without the law and without a court system for people to settle disputes, we are barbarians. 
the only way you can settle disputes is with violence if you don't settle them through a civilized means, through court. Uh, but that has nothing to do with Libra cryptocurrency, although I'm sure there's already been a ton of litigation over this and there will probably be more. Here's the point, okay? So Facebook's Libra cryptocurrency project launched in 2019 immediately ran into problems because, well, governments don't want the Zuckbuck, that's, you know, Zuckerberg, obviously, to replace their national currencies now the Libra launch is scaled back uh, to launch next year. But this is what I've been saying since the beginning of this cryptocurrency craze. By the way, for those who don't know, I have, a, I have many podcasts I publish, many different shows, and one is called The Cryptocast. I always ha also have the Short-Term Rental Profits podcast if you're interested in Airbnb stuff. But my main show is the one you see on the screen, The Creating Wealth Show. And, uh, and I have many others. And, um, you know, cryptocurrency, I think it's very interesting. I would love to be wrong about this. I want to put that on the record that I would love to be wrong about it. And I do own a little bit of Bitcoin. And I'm actually going to buy a little bit more. Okay? I just want to be very upfront about that. I'm planning to buy some more uh, through one of my uh, entities. But I don't think the long-term outlook for cryptocurrencies that are aren't that are i'll say uh not non-government or central bank backed cryptocurrencies i don't think the long-term outlook is good uh but who knows how long it'll take for governments to shut them down and and central banks to shut them down because folks you've just got to remember the fundamental idea that look at Every company produces products, right? Every company produces widgets. And those widgets, which a widget is nothing more than an economic unit, right? Uh, you know, I, I was an econ major in college. Uh, and um, uh, the widgets basically, uh, you know, are, are produced by every company, right? They produce, you know, cars or, uh, you know, food or, you know, whatever they produce. Maybe they make microphones, you know, whatever, right? Um, cell phones, sound effect machines, shirts, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, those are all widgets, okay? But the widget of every government and central bank on earth is currency. It's their currency. It's the dollar, the yen, the ruble, the peso, the Brazilian real, whatever it is, okay? The renminbi, Okay, what whatever it's a currency that's their product. Okay, now listen, a lot of you watching right now, you own your own business, you own your own company, and you produce some widgets, right? Maybe your widget is an information product, maybe it's consulting, maybe it's a service like a haircut. Okay, that's a widget too. All right, and so you don't love, I guarantee you, without even knowing you, you don't love competition. Okay. You don't love when a competitor undercuts your price or maybe, you know, discover something new or add some feature to their product that makes it better than yours. And that happens. It's always a race going back and forth, back and forth. You know, who's winning, who's winning, right? It's, it's always like this, right? And do you think governments want competition? Do you think central banks want competition for their widget? They only have one widget. It's their currency. That's all they really sell, if you think about it. And they force you to buy it through what's called legal tender laws. And, and the government forces you to buy the dollar. I mean, look right on the dollar. It says, for all debts, public and private. Okay? And so this is their widget. Now, if you think they are going to sit back and allow other widgets to compete with them when they have the ultimate competition squisher. <laughs> a competition squisher. Yes. There are, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies try to uh, squish competition with dirty deeds, industrial espionage, uh, unfair competition, patents, patent trolling. Okay. You've heard of patent trolling probably. Uh, you know, they try to, they, they litigate, they sue other companies, they sue their competitors, 
Uh, they badmouth them. They tell lies about them, uh, you know, and they try to make, make it so it's harder to compete with their widget. Well, guess what the government has? They have the ultimate competition squisher. They don't, you know, they do sue people. The government certainly sues people with, through regulatory action, right? Um, and uh, and sometimes those suits are just, and they're in the you know they're in the name of the consumers, and and they're good. You know, the, I mean, a lot of these things are legitimate, right? The antitrust lawsuits against the big tech companies, those are wonderful. I'm super happy about them. Yes, because they have been abusing us for way too many years. Uh, hopefully that'll go somewhere. We'll see. We'll see. But guess what the governments have is the ultimate competition squisher. Squish that competition. They have standing armies. They have militaries. They And they have police forces. And they can squish anything they want to squish. Because nobody, 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 nobody can compete with governments in their power to squish competition. So I just want to give you that word of caution about cryptocurrencies. All right, inflation. If you follow me on Twitter at Jason Hartman ROI, you saw this. So go follow me right now on Twitter, right? You know, Jack Dorsey, man, he is the, he is the king of censorship. Jack Dorsey is, yes. Jack Dorsey doesn't like free speech. Uh, when it disagrees with his idea. Uh, and that's absolutely disgusting. Shame on him. But whatever. Uh, you know, he's obviously a bright businessman and uh, he's created some cool stuff uh, and uh, is a privacy abuser just like the others. But uh, look at this. This says, uh, this is uh, an article I posted about global food prices hit six year high. Okay. Who says there's no inflation, right? Who says there's no inflation? Now, here's another thing, since we're talking about the pandemic and inflation. Um, have you noticed these stories the last couple of weeks about these absolutely disgusting hypocrite politicians who make all kinds of... I mean, what's going on right now, folks, is a, is a tyrant dictator's dream. The, the pandemic has given them so much opportunity to do everything they always wanted to do in their happiest dreams. They're coming true right now. Dictators, tyrants, hypocrites, and uh, disgusting uh, government people, uh, they are loving this time. This is like their time to shine right now. Yep, it is. And it's their time to be, and to, it's their time to, uh, to flaunt their hypocrisy because they're making all sorts of rules like Gavin Newsom, the disgusting governor of California. You know, he's out at the French Laundry restaurant uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, no one's wearing a mask, gathering with 12 people at the table, gathering with lobbyists who will undoubtedly get uh, laws uh, and regulations in their favor that, believe me, are not in your favor. Because <laughs> they're having dinner with Gaz Gavin Newsom. And who do you think paid for the dinner? I'm sure it wasn't Gavin Newsom. Uh, he uh, he didn't pay. And, uh, you know, here's uh, Garcetti and all, all of the, I mean, you know, the, the Texas, one of the Texas mayors was telling everybody, stay home, don't travel. Yet he's in, uh, where was he, in Cabo San Lucas or Cancun or something like that, you know, uh, publishing from his trip there on social media. <laughs> Folks, it's absolutely ridiculous. The other thing that's interesting, well, not interesting, but super scary, is that San Francisco is becoming one of many left-wing lawless jurisdictions where they just won't enforce the law. Crimes are being committed everywhere and all the criminals know they can get away with it because law enforcement is just ignoring the crimes. So right here, you know, San Francisco uh, man was arrested for vehicle theft for the 13th time in just 18 months. So in a year and a half, this guy has been arrested 13 times, okay? And, um, you know, uh, the DA linked to scumbag George Soros. You can tell I don't make many friends, do I, right? <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, won't, won't, won't prosecute. 
right? It's it's just unbelievable. I, I, you know, it's so in San Francisco. If you want to burglarize cars, feel free. It looks like you know, just go right ahead. By the way, that's not advice, <laughs> okay? But uh, it's sadly, sadly true. Uh, again, I'll mention a lot of people absolutely love our asset protection webinar. And we are running that on replay right now. There's the link up on your screen, jasonhartman.com slash protect. Yeah, well, it's actually on the slide already, Jason. You don't need to put it up there. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people keep attending that and loving it and getting their LLCs and their family limited partnerships, their FLPs and, and their trust uh, all set up to plan their state, protect their assets and reduce their tax liability. Remember, Taxes are the single largest expense any of us have in our lives, yet we will spend more time shopping for a better deal on a product, on a widget, okay? We shop around for those widgets, but we don't spend much time tax planning. We don't spend much time creating the entities, we, the legal structures we could should create to reduce our tax liability. And, uh, you know, a big part of asset protection is protecting our assets from our own government. Okay, so go check that out. Totally free. You will learn a lot um, at that. Okay, um, the powers that be, the uh, the hypocrites. We're talking about them. The billionaires, the billionaire class, the elites. They're doing pretty well, folks. And um, I want to call out one in particular, I guess here, and that's Bill Gates. Bill Gates. I uh, wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. Uh, you know he. He looks so trustworthy, though. He looks like like that really nice grandpa uh, you probably wish you had. I certainly wish I had. You know, he's wearing his nice sweater, and he's talking about vaccines and all that stuff. Yet, of course, he he uh, is going to become more rich and more powerful with the vaccines he's recommending, of course. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's you can't make this stuff up, folks. Look into the Gates, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and look at all the hypocrisy. Uh, you know, make sure you've seen the TED Talk at like 27 minutes in. Bill Gates accidentally has his Freudian slip. It's not Freudian in terms of the sexual context, but maybe he gets off on stuff like this, maybe sexually, who knows? Uh, and, um, you know, he's uh, he says, that maybe we can reduce the population through vaccines. Wow. Bill, what does that mean? Hmm. Folks, comment below and tell me what you think Bill Gates means when he said in his in one of his TED Talks, you can go look it up, it's there, unless they've censored it and taken it down by now, or maybe they've edited it. But the comment was about 27 minutes into this one TED Talk I watched maybe 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. Uh, and uh, Bill Gates says, you know, something to the effect of, we can hopefully reduce the population of the world through vaccines. What does he mean by that? I wonder. So comment below and tell me what you think he means. Okay. Uh, but they're getting a lot richer, folks. The pandemic has really enriched all these bigwigs. Okay. Good old Jeff Bezos. He's making a lot of money, uh, and that's kind of logical. I mean, Amazon would uh, at-home shopping would certainly thrive during these times, right? Uh, but he's also done all sorts of unethical, unfair things to put his competitors out of business with uh, traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Uh, good old Elon, man, that guy is killing it. And listen, I got to give Elon credit where it's due. I mean, he is a definitely a visionary and uh, doing some great stuff, but. Uh, my last Tesla was a piece of junk. That was a piece of absolute junk. I'm glad I finally got them to take that thing back. I, I don't plan to buy another Tesla anytime soon. Um, and uh, Gates, well, he's getting richer. Good old Zuckerberg. We're talking on his platform. He's getting really, really rich during the pandemic. And good old Warren Buffett, he, him too. He's uh, He says all kinds of hypocritical things too, you know. It's just amazing. So you don't have to worry, folks, about the elite class. They're doing just fine. They're doing just fine. Okay, I want to switch on um, on this. I got to switch to another presentation, a different presentation here. 
to share with you a couple of things here. I want to talk a little bit about, um, well, a couple things from, and this is from my Creating Wealth presentation, which by the way, I think we're going to be offering this virtually. Imagine that, doing something virtually. Yep, nowadays we do things virtually. So we're going to do this on Zoom. We haven't done it before on Zoom, uh, but we're going to offer this probably as a, um, uh, you know, a, a, like a once a week or maybe even a twice a week uh, class. Maybe we'll do it like six evenings, right? Maybe we'll do that in place of the live stream, but this is going to be a paid event. Okay, this is always a paid event. Uh, and, you know, I've had thousands of people come through this, uh, this event and it's evolved over the years, but I've been doing it since 2004. And um, uh, so I just wanted to share with you a couple of things from it here. So I'll just advance this and uh, we're not going to talk about this stuff right here, but I do want to talk about this one. And uh, this was uh, mentioned in the pre-roll video for today. Uh, commandment number three has been out of my 10. Now, what are we up to? I think we've got I think we've got 23 Ten Commandments. <laughs> what I mean is that started out as 10, but I kept adding to it, and I think we're up to 23 now. But anyway, commandment number three has been an all-time favorite, an all-time favorite for people. Because what it talks about is the importance of maining, maintaining control. Thou shalt maintain control when investing. In other words, I want you to be a direct investor. I want you to have control over your investments. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, when you relinquish control, when you are not a direct investor, when you invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, someone else's partnership, LLC, private placement memorandum, whatever it is, you are relinquishing control to somebody else to an investment banker, a CEO, a board of directors, a fund manager, whatever it is, right? When you do that, you're relinquishing control to somebody else. And you leave yourself susceptible to three major problems. Number one problem, number one problem is you might be investing with a crook. Uh, I don't have to tell you about Enron, WorldCom, Global Crossing, uh, now, Nicola, I mean, I haven't even talked about that. I've been meaning to talk about that one on the podcast. What an epic scam that was. Uh, Nicola, you know, the electric truck maker, oh, total scam. And by the way, if you think you are too brilliant to be scammed by these people and that you will find the right companies and the right fund managers to invest with, well, I want to ask you this. Um, how many uh, due diligence people, lawyers, brilliant accountants, MBAs, how many of those people do you think work for a company like GM, General Motors, General Motors, right? Huge hundred year old company, I think, right? Guess what? General Motors got scammed by Nikola. Yeah, they got scammed. Okay. So if you think that you know, you're just going to figure it all out and make sure you don't get scammed. Look at all the brilliant people that get scammed by these crooks. How many, how many funds or, uh, you know, hedge funds do you think own stock in Enron, WorldCom, Global Crossing, or invested with Bernie Madoff? Okay. Tons of them did. Brilliant, high-end, rich people. Okay. They got burned by these crooks. So, if they can't figure it out, I don't think we can figure it out, all right? So you might be investing with a crook, number one problem. Number two problem, you might be investing with an idiot. And either way, you're going to lose money because of their crookery or their stupidity. And the number three problem is, even if they're honest and competent, they take huge management fees off the top for managing the deal, okay? Huge management fees. And uh, remember, it's always the insiders who get rich. By the way, just uh, yesterday or the day before, I downloaded the audiobook with that great title. And it's the title is a question. And I would recommend you go get this audiobook. You can get it on Scribd 
which is a great service. By the way, this is not a commercial, <laughs> okay? Uh, but you know, you just pay like ten bucks a month, and you get unlimited audiobooks. That's really cool. Uh, and um, uh, they don't have, you know, they don't have all of them on there, but they've got a great selection. Anyway, they've got the book "Where Are All the Customers' Yachts," right? Which is the famous Wall Street question. And it's so great. It was written so long ago and talked about all the scams on Wall Street. Um, and those scams have only become better, more prevalent, and more sophisticated. And I'm going to say one other thing to you, more legalized. See, we have to remember something. There is a, um, a distinction here that's important to understand. Just because something is legal doesn't mean it's not a scam. There are all sorts of legal things that are absolutely wrong, unethical, uh, unjust, okay? It's just that the big, disgusting elites uh, that run the big, giant corporations, guess what they have to make uh, unethical, immoral, disgusting thing legal? They have lobbyists, okay? They have armies of lobbyists. I mean, look at Google. They spend millions and millions of dollars on lobbyists, okay? They have an army of people that go lobby government to change the laws in their favor, okay? There, is, there, there doesn't have to be anything illegal about it. The difference between what is legal and what is right is, you know, th those, you know, the twain shall never meet, okay, sometimes. Um, now, sometimes laws are just and sometimes they aren't. I mean, there used to be laws that, you know, uh, you could own slaves or you have to sit on the back of the bus, okay? You know, the, these were laws, right? And, and you know, we, we eventually got the bad laws overturned, some of them. But nowadays we live in a, in a country and really a world where we are undergoing a corporate takeover. The world has been taken over by corporations. Did you ever see that old movie, The Billionaire Boys Club? Uh, you know, I watched it again recently and it's really, and I don't mean that they made a new version of it, but I'm talking about the original version from, I don't know, 25 years ago or something. And you know what I'm going to remind you to do? You must watch old movies. You must watch old TV shows and you must listen to old music and read old books just to make sure you have the perspective of how absolutely screwed up the world is nowadays. The world is totally screwed up. But at the same time, it's an amazing time to be alive. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Jason, you're contradicting yourself. No, I'm not. Because some things are absolutely amazing. I mean, there are amazing things happening, mostly with technology uh, nowadays. Uh, and, you know, longevity sciences and all these kinds of things that are just going to change the world in so many amazing, amazing ways. Um, but we are undergoing a corporate takeover of the planet and especially the United States, maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Um, you know, uh, uh, Joe Biden and Barack Obama, his former boss, if Joe Biden is elected president, uh, we can already see that we are going to undergo a further <laughs> massively accelerated corporate takeover of the country. I mean, every guy, or every guy, <laughs> well, they're mostly guys, actually. Um, every person that Joe Biden, who who is a total puppet, obviously, I mean, you know, he has dementia. He's certainly not qualified to be the leader of the free world. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how free the world is anymore, but whatever. That's another discussion. Um, but every everybody is like this you know, corporate swamp dweller, okay? And, uh, you know, the reason, one of the reasons Trump is so hated is because he really did try to drain the swamp. And man, it's tough to drain the swamp when you have these things called iron triangles, okay? You have these iron triangles, these interests at every side of the triangle that, that support each other. You know, remember, a triangle is the strongest structure, right? Uh, I heard an egg was, but I don't know. It's pretty easy to crack an egg, but I guess you can't crack it from one direction very well or something. I don't know. Write in the comments below and teach me about eggs being the strongest structure in nature, I guess. Uh, but um, the strongest, uh, you know, man-made structure is a triangle, okay? 
triangles are very strong. And uh, so they have these iron triangles they set up in the corporatocracy and government, and they all support each other. So it makes it very hard to ever dislodge them. You know, that's the way it is with public employee unions or unions in general. There are iron triangles in that world and iron triangles in government, central banks, all these unholy alliances, right? And so, uh, so that's the thing. But one of the things, if you uh, attend our Creating Wealth event, which, by the way, I do not have a link for you because we haven't scheduled it yet or anything, but it's coming up. Um, they take huge management fees off the top for managing the deal. And uh, one of them uh, from, I don't have it handy here, but Lou Dobbs' book, uh, War on the Middle Class, which is a great book that I read back in maybe 2005, I think. Uh, he uh, talked in chapter two about these, um, you know, corporate CEOs, their boards of directors, and all the money uh, they make for running the companies, which is totally out of sync with the shareholders. It has, it's completely detached. You know, at a time when shareholders are losing money, okay, back when he wrote the book, um, the the CEOs, the boards of directors, uh, the C-suite people, they're all voting in huge raises and bonuses for themselves. And one example was absolutely insane. I do remember it from Lou Dobbs' book, War on the Middle Class, which is a great book. Um, must read from 15 years ago or so. Uh, he talked about Larry Ellison, the founder and CEO of Oracle. And uh, boy, that's a that's a guy who hates Bill Gates. Bill Gates and Larry Ellison, they've been going at it for years, man. Those two hate each other. They are like enemies. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so he talks about Larry Ellison, founder and CEO of Oracle. And he says, from 2000 to 2002, in a mere two years, uh, uh, the stock of Oracle when I think it lost like 61% of its value or something, okay? Don't quote me on the exact number, but somewhere it's close enough for government work, folks. Go and read Lou Dobbs' book and he'll tell you exactly. And then um, in that two years, uh, the shareholders lost 61% of their money. But at the same time, in those same two years, and number not exact, but close enough, uh, Larry Ellison's personal take from Oracle was something like $720 million, okay? Almost a billion dollars. Cha-ching, yeah. He took almost a billion dollars out of the company in two years <laughs> while the shareholders lost like 61% of their investment. So totally detached from the shareholders, right? Uh, I mean, just absolutely insane. There's just no relation, so... Uh, do not invest in pooled money assets. I mean, you know, you know, if you have a big portfolio, you might be investing some money in pooled money assets. But try as much as you can to be a direct investor and invest in things that you own, you control. And that's what I love about income property. You know, when you go to jasonhartman.com slash properties, or if you attend our uh, webinar that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen about Alabama property investments, at jasonhartman.com slash sweet home, like sweet home Alabama. Uh, you buy properties and you control them. You own them. You decide what to buy, where to buy, when to buy, how to finance it, who to rent it to, how much to rent it for, when to refinance it, when to sell it, when to do a 1031 tax deferred exchange. It's all your decision. You're, you are in control. Okay. And you don't leave yourself susceptible to these big ripoffs. This is such an important thing. If you only do one thing with your investments, maintain control. Follow all of my commandments. You can find out more on the podcast, The Creating Wealth Show, and uh, uh, on my YouTube channel. But, you know, maintain control. You know, look at nobody gets rich investing in somebody else's deal very often. Yes, there are a few examples. You know, there's uh, a few people that invest in very early stage, like the the first investors in Fakebook uh, or, you know, in Tesla or whatever, right? But that's not you. That's not going to be you coming along nowadays, years later, right? You're not getting founders stock, right? Uh, before they go public and have some giant run up. You know, people don't usually get rich investing in somebody else's deal. 
they get rich investing in their own deal, you know, whether it be their own business or their own properties. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're a controlling owner, okay? That's the, the, should be the lion's share of your investment strategy is investing in things that you actually control. So just buy some houses, buy some houses and rent them out. It's so simple. It's so simple and it works so incredibly, incredibly well. Okay, so let me uh, go to the next thing here. Actually, let's get some of your questions. I want to fast forward to another slide here. So as I'm doing that, uh, get some of your questions. Let me just see here. There is so much content in this Creating Wealth event. When we announce it, I sure hope you attend because it's a fantabulous event. Okay, here's what I want to share with you. Here's what I want to share with you. All right. Okay, so we will we will get to that in just a moment. All right. But let's go to some of your comments and questions again. Where are we? All right. John says, you cannot have a currency based upon humanity uh, debt. We have to go back to a sound gold-based currency. There will be unlimited tech opportunities to do that. Uh, it's just a matter of, well, well, John, look, at I appreciate the sentiment. You know, Ron Paul has been on my podcast. Um, you know, I've had all the gold bugs on my podcast and, you know, conceptually it sounds nice, right? Sound money, certainly not necessarily gold to tie the currency to gold. It just ain't never going to happen. <laughs> As the saying goes, it ain't never going to happen. Okay. Number one, there's not enough gold in the world to do it. Number two, there's no incentive to do it. Why would anybody want to do it? Why would any politician who controls these things or central bank or central banker, why would they want a gold backed currency? There's nothing in it for them. They can't debase the currency then. They can't inflate their way out of the debts they've run up. Okay. They can't, it's, it's a bad deal. Why would they want to do it? You know, listen, what I have been teaching for 17 years now is the idea that we need to align our interest with the most powerful forces the human race has ever known, governments and central banks. You know, basically, here's the hierarchy, folks. There's God, okay, uh, and then there's governments, and then there's central banks. And actually, that's debatable as to which one's more powerful, governments or central banks. Uh, I would say governments. Okay, but they're they're in you know they're in cahoots with each other, of course. Okay, so we want look at we can complain about it all we want, but we're not going to change it. These these forces are too powerful, and their their incentives. Okay, uh, look another great book recommendation I want to give you, uh, a very short small book. I don't even know if you can find it anymore. I think it's I I think I discovered it back in 1989. Yeah, I was two years old. Uh, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, back in 1989, I think is when I read this book. It's called The Greatest Management Principle in the World by Michael LeBeau or Michael LeBuff, however you say that. And it is such a great book. Basically, the thesis of the whole thing is this. What gets rewarded gets repeated. What gets rewarded gets repeated. And that is brilliant, folks. And that's what we need to understand is that there are huge rewards for having a fiat currency. And there will be even more rewards for having a fiat cryptocurrency. Well, actually, every cryptocurrency in existence is fiat. Okay, well... No, that's wrong. It's not really fiat, okay? Because fiat means by authority or by decree. So no one said you had to use Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or any of these cryptocurrencies, okay? What they, what they, what what those fans say is that the the dollar is fiat, and that's true. The dollar the dollar is fiat, but the dollar is not backed by gold but it is backed by the military. 
It's backed by aircraft carriers and intercontinental ballistic missiles and uh, satellites and police forces. You know, to say the dollar isn't backed by anything is absolutely stupid. I mean, that's just not true. It's totally backed, okay? And what it's backed by is a lot more powerful than gold. It, it is. Um, but there's no incentive for any of the powers that be to go to gold standard. They're just not going to do it. Even if, even if there was, even if they wanted to, even if everybody voted tomorrow, back the dollar by gold, it's just not going to happen. Okay. It's just not going to happen. But it, you know, I agree with you that it would be nice to have sound money. I agree with Ron Paul, who spoke at one of our events and has been on the podcast, of course, but it, it's just not going to happen. There's no reason, there's no incentive, okay? Okay. Question, well, I think I just addressed that one, John. So, okay. And Rob is in Socialist Diego. <laughs> San Diego, yes, good, good stuff. And Barry is in Baltimore, right by the belly of the beast, Barry in Washington, D.C. Okay, Ultimate Bargain says, same SHIT that brought down 2008 housing is happening again with realtors and banksters at ground zero. I would disagree with you, ultimate bargains. Um, how's that true? The, the mortgage underwriting isn't, isn't crazy like it was back then. So what uh, if you got some splaining to do, ultimate bargains. Like uh, I can't imitate Ricky Ricardo very well, but you got some splaining to do, Lucy. I love that. That's so funny. That was the greatest show. The Lucille Ball show. <laughs> Talk about old. I love watching old shows like that. She was so funny and Ricky was so funny. Lucy, you got some splaining to do. Yeah. Well, ultimate bargains, you got some splaining to do because I don't get it. I don't think it's the same. I think there are other things that, you know, could bring down the economy. Certainly. I don't disagree with you there. Absolutely agree with you a hundred percent, but it's not careless mortgages this time around. I mean, there are some mortgages that certainly will go default, uh, but um, not not for the same reason or in the same way. Okay. Um, beachfront? No, I don't think beachfront location will always be uh, uh, will always be worth uh, more. Well, I guess it'll be worth more than if the same area being inland, but um, that's changing too. You know. Uh, Number one, you've got more natural disasters in beachfront locations. Uh, you've got um, self-driving cars that can take people to those locations much more easily. So, uh, you know, I, I think, it. I, I mean, listen, most people would rather live on the beach versus inland. Yes, I agree with you there. But I'm just saying it's not as powerful as it used to be, okay? Uh, it still matters. It's just less so than before. That's all I'm saying. Okay. You and George will be running the same time again. Oh, Rob, thanks for letting me know that. Does that mean my live stream and George's will be at the same time? Uh, well, hey, I might be doing a meetup with George next week here in Florida. He, he's, I'm waiting for him to get back to me on that. We were just talking about it this morning. So um, I don't know. Uh, I didn't know that was George's time. So we may revise that, folks, because I don't, you know, George and I share a lot of the same audience, a lot of bright people there. So we'll see about that. Okay. So stay tuned. We might make a revision. We'll see. Okay. Football. What, is, what does that mean? Okay. Hi, Jason. If you change the time, oh, you'll be competing with football. Well, hey, look, professional, or uh, what do I want to say? I, I'm going to, What I think it was uh, Joseph Stalin who said, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, which, by the way, I disagree with that. I think religion's a good thing for society. Um, but I'm going to say that spectator sports are the opiate of the masses. <laughs> so maybe you should be listening to me rather than football. But um, yeah, I'll think about that. Listen, I know lots of people love, love spectator sports. Uh, but um, remember, when you watch spectator sports, you are playing in to the powers that be, just like when you're in, on social media, wasting all your life on Facebook, which, listen, I've done too many times. Uh, okay, so George wins that time slot. Oh, darn it. Okay, thanks for letting me know who's 
George? <laughs> uh, the answer is right here. Who's George? Okay. And uh, the answer is there again. Thank you. We'll look it up. All right. Um, what does this mean? George Gammon is too crowdy like LA. I don't know what that means. Um, Los Angeles, my hometown, the city of angels, Detroitificationizing, yes. We are, California has been Detroiting, Detroiting itself for many years, but it's only getting worse. And John is in Brandon, Mississippi, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -S 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 <laughs> we all learned how to spell that in school, right? And AK is in Seattle, the Socialist Revol Republic of Seattle. Long corrupt police department in City Hall, Beach Hall. Is Hall Beach in there or City Hall? Hall Beach, California? I don't know where that is. That's interesting. I've never heard of that place. Okay. And physical natural resource like gold and silver. Okay. Jason Hartman, I digress. Cool artwork. What's their story? Oh, artwork. Well, um, this piece I sold to one of my companies years ago, but I bought that personally originally. That is by a uh, Chinese artist named uh, Jang. And um, it's a really good piece. It's called, I think that one's called Blue Lady. And um, as you can see, it's a, uh, a woman on a bunch of horses right there. Yeah, I got to turn the camera the right way. A uh, woman on a bunch of horses, that's Blue Lady. And then this other one is just one that I bought. I think I bought that at an auction uh, years ago and also sold that to one of my companies. You want to keep um, your stuff uh inside of different entities folks you know that's one of the uh uh the the things you definitely want to do for uh estate planning asset protection and tax purposes okay so uh that's important all right so so make sure you do that but uh thank you yeah i love art i used to go to art auctions and buy lots of art uh, but now i don't have enough walls for all the art so uh <laughs> you gotta have enough walls for it um you know samsung is out with a cool new tv i think it's samsung uh, that uh, turns into a work of art uh, when it is not on. And it does that with an OLED. So it's not, you know, backlit and bright. It looks really like art. You know, Bill Gates, when he built his, you know, absolute mansion in, uh, in Seattle area years ago, uh, I remember, that, you know, when nobody could afford flat, fat, not fat, but flat, <laughs> fat, flat panel TVs back then, plasma displays they were back then, but now their OLED is the best, I think. And um, Bill Gates, uh, you know, that was a big talk about his his home, that it had all these flat panel displays that were high definition and displayed artwork and all the masters, and they would, they would change to the visitor's preferences. So as you would walk down a hallway in Bill Gates' home, uh, you know, the artwork would change to your liking of the person who was walking down the hallway. Isn't that amazing? So if you like impressionist art, like I do, or, you know, I like lots of art, but impressionist is one of my favorites, uh, you know, Monet and so forth. Uh, then, uh, then the, the displays would all change to suit your taste. Isn't that cool? Uh, nowadays, you know, you could do that much more inexpensively, but back then it was a big deal. Okay. Big, big deal. Okay. So do you want your main property one in which you live in a linear, well, you want as many properties as possible, Sunil, in linear markets. If you have to live in a cyclical market, try and rent a property there for your personal residence. And cycl cyclical markets are more expensive. So, um, you know, you, you can rent those properties for a, a very good rent to value ratio favorable to you as the tenant and then buy lots of other properties in linear markets, inexpensive rental properties like in Alabama, for example, and our webinar scrolling across the bottom of the screen, shameless self-promoter, jasonhartman.com slash sweet home. You don't have to write Alabama or type Alabama. It's just jasonhartman.com slash sweet home. Check out that webinar. And, uh, and learn more about it. That's a great linear market, Alabama, with super low property taxes, by the way, that makes your cash flow a lot better. Uh, so uh, so ideally, uh, ideally, rent your home in a cyclical market to live in and own lots of other houses in linear markets to rent to other people. 
that are lower price where you have the, you arbitrage the rent to value ratio. It'll be more favorable to you as the tenant in a cyclical market. And it'll be more favorable to you as an owner, as a landlord, as an investor in a linear market. So you're, you're getting like this double arbitrage on the rent to value ratio. Very, very good thing. All right. Um, is this live? Yes, this is live. Is it live or is it Memorex? It's live, folks. It is 1221 Eastern Time on Sunday, December 6th. And I am live right here, right now. Look at, we have a live audience. They're clapping. <laughs> but they clap too long. They really should make it a shorter clap. Yes, this is definitely live. And I am answering your questions live. Okay, Paul asks, do you think real estate prices will keep going up with the destruction of the dollar? Well, that's a good question, Paul. And I'm gonna take you back to my famous question. The what my listeners and my audience has dubbed the Jason Hartman question. Maybe you know what I'm going to say if you're a regular follower. The Jason Hartman question is compared to what? Compared to what? Okay. So compared to the dollar, you have answered your own question, Paul. You don't need me to answer it because if the dollar goes down in value, then commodities, naturally, which are the ingredients of our properties, uh, look around back here, besides the beautiful artwork, thank you for that, you see, uh, you see lumber, well, you know, in the walls, right? Uh, lumber, copper wire, petroleum products, uh, glass, steel, concrete, uh, and other building materials, right? All of these building materials are commodities that have intrinsic value regardless of any currency. They have value to every human on earth because every human needs food, clothing, and shelter. Shelter. And so those commodities, um, they don't have to go up in value. But if the currency goes down in value, meaning we create more currency units out of thin air, which is what governments and central banks do, okay? And they've done it more than ever lately. Uh, and as we have more debt, it devalues all the currency units. Then relative to the currency, real estate has gone up in price. And uh, you get what I call the double inflation arbitrage, which by the way, maybe we'll talk about that on a future show, but we certainly talk about that at the Creating Wealth event that we're going to do on Zoom coming up as a live event, okay? And, um, you know, we also have a class on that. Maybe we'll do that as a hybrid event. That might be the best way to do it. Okay, more to come on that. But uh, you get a double inflation arbitrage because the debt against that property and the monthly payment on that debt decrease in value relative to the dollar, so it gets cheaper to repay, inflation pays off your mortgage, but also the price relative to the currency unit, meaning the dollar in this case, increases. And so it's it's just a beautiful thing. And this is the hidden wealth creator that has made so many real estate investors so rich for decades and decades and decades, okay? It's a wonderful thing. So the answer to your question is yes, but uh, I just want to say you didn't need me to tell you that because you answered that question really in your own question, which was fascinating. So thank you for that, Paul. That's really good. Good stuff. Okay. So Mary says, awesome. Yes. I think that was relating to the artwork. Okay. So Jason, we we're thinking about uh, doing... Yeah, folks, try not to have typos because it makes me think too much to correct them for you. So we're thinking about doing something uh, uh, that makes things better, uh, not the probability of it. So what do you, what do you mean? Oh, well here, you got something else here. Okay. I read it all as it says, it's making things better or not. Oh, I think John, we're talking about your comment earlier about the gold standard, right? So yeah, listen, um, I would, I agree with you. Okay. But it's just not going to happen. Okay. So, uh, you know, wishful thinking, if it happens, Hey, great. I'll, uh, you know, sound money would is a, is a, is a beautiful idea, but do I think it's going to happen? No, I don't. 
What's your opinion of the time frame that government will roll out a digital currency? How long will the rollout take? I think it's coming pretty fast. Um, how long is pretty fast, you ask? I don't know. <laughs> I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see a real, real movement toward a, a Fed coin or a digital dollar or whatever. And, you know, we will be engaging with that on our phones. And uh, it's going to give the powers that be unprecedented control over our lives. And then we will next move into a tyrannical social scoring type of idea like China is already doing. And it's, it's, a, it's a bad time for liberty, folks. This is, you know, read 1984, read Fahrenheit 451, read Brave New World, or watch the movies. You know, there are several movies, you know, documentaries about these if you don't like reading, but you really, it's happening right before our eyes and the pandemic has really accelerated all of that. So that's the way it is. Okay, uh, let me go through this slide with you. So look, uh, the government has too much debt, okay? Hey, oh, wait a second, hang on a minute here. Okay, hang on, hang on. See, it's hard for me to do all this at once. This is live, folks. Is it live or is it Memorex? <laughs> like the commercial goes. All right, let me put this on the screen here. Oh, oh, I guess I can put it right in front of this, right? Yeah, that's fine. So this is the debt clock. You Maybe you've seen this before, the debt clock. And it basically, I mean, the numbers are moving and they're moving fast, folks. So 27 trillion is the US national debt. That's $82,000 per citizen. And since not every citizen is a taxpayer, it's $219,000 per taxpayer, okay? And uh, look at this, it's, it's just insane. You can get the mobile app, okay? So go get the mobile app for the debt clock and uh, you get 3,000 live stats in your pocket. Boy, they should be a sponsor because I'm really promoting them, aren't I? <laughs> yes, I am. Okay, but anyway, this just type in debt clock and uh, don't do it on Google because Google is evil. Uh, do it on Bing. Oh, no way, that'd be Microsoft. They're evil too. Use DuckDuckGo because they're the least evil of the bunch, okay? And type in debt clock or go to debt clock, usdebtclock.org and you can see this for yourself. So uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. It tells you like how many bankruptcies there are, foreclosures, number of people living in poverty, uh, number of people without insurance, uh, you know, private sector jobs, uh, self-employed people, not in the labor force now, full-time workers, part-time workers. You know, it's just really fascinating, all the, all the stats here, okay, on the debt clock. So that's that. So we're in debt, right? I didn't have to tell you that, you already knew. But the question is, how does the government get out of the mess they're in? How do they do that? Well, they could default, as you see on the screen, they could default. They could just say, look, we're sorry. We don't have the money. We've overspent. Um, as Ronald Reagan said, to say that the U.S. government spends like a drunken sailor is an insult to drunken sailors. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Reagan was so witty and he had such great, uh, great sayings. And, uh, and so, look, the government is not likely to default. And you saw when they have these what they call austerity measures, you saw what happened in England, in Greece, in many countries around the world when they had to institute austerity measures, because these countries did not have the benefit of being the United States. They didn't have the reserve currency of the world and the military to keep it that way. So there were what? There were riots when they defaulted on the promises. So they're not likely to default because it's politically unpopular, okay? So what's the next option? Well, some say they could raise taxes, but that won't work. Uh, the first reason it won't work is because there's not enough tax dollars to get, like I, I was saying earlier. But the other reason is, uh, is that if you believe in the Laffer curve, Arthur Laffer, who I met uh, many years ago, uh, he was uh, uh, Reagan's uh, economic advisor. 
and he is famous for, uh, and he's still around. Uh, I'd like to get him on the show. I have not interviewed him yet. But um, uh, uh, Arthur Laffer came up with this idea that, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it partially beside, behind, blah, blah, what am I, I can't think. I need another cup of coffee or I need lunch, one or the other. Um, uh, the idea of the Laffer curve, okay? And uh, basically, the, that whole school of thought in the Reagan era was supply side economics, trickle down economics. And listen, you know, a lot of people have said, well, it doesn't work. It's not true. And look, nothing is perfect. Okay. It, it, you know, compared to what is the question, right? It's not perfect. And the elite class will try at every step to stop uh, trickle down economics from occurring. And they've, they've put roadblocks up to stop it from happening, but largely trickle down economics, supply side economics, it, it does work. Okay. It, it's not perfect. It doesn't trickle down to everybody and the elites, the elite scumbags, they put up roadblocks to stop it from trickling down. And you know what, you know, who else does is Democrat government, De Democrat uh, government people put roadblocks in to stop it from trickling down, okay? And they do it under the guise of trying to help the people that they say they're supporting, their own constituency. But the fact is, every time, in every case practically, they ultimately hurt those people. They don't help them, they hurt them. And why would they do that? Well, you know, maybe it's just out of stupidity, maybe it's out of intent. None of us are sure. But the, they, they want those people to be dependent. They want them to suffer because if they're not dependent, then they can't control them and they can't get them to vote for them. You know, when, when people become successful, they usually become conservative, okay? They usually become fiscally conservative. When they're not successful and they're in poverty, they're liberal. I mean, you know, what do you think? You want to lose voters? If, if you're a Democrat and, uh, you know, you're running some area of government, whether you're president or mayor or whatever you are, right? You, you don't want your people to rise up and become successful, lift, lift themselves up by their own bootstraps. That's not going to be good for you, right? That's going to be terrible. You're going to lose your, your constituency. They're going to become Republicans. So uh, why would you want them to actually be helped? What you want to do is you want to convince them that you're helping them without really helping them. Okay, you want to have a lot of window dressing, uh, and 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 make them think you're going to help them. You want to you want to you want to say good things like we're going to give you this, we're going to give you that, but you don't really want to deliver. And here's one of the ways they don't deliver. Okay, well it's coming up. I'll tell you in a moment. I'll tell you in a moment. Hold that thought. Okay. The other thing the U.S. could do to get out of its problem with its twenty-seven trillion dollars, we just looked at the debt clock. Okay. They could have a yard sale. They could sell some stuff, right? The U S has a lot of stuff, right? They have a lot of assets. They have military equipment that they could sell to Libya. <laughs> that was what we were going to do years ago. Right. Remember that? Uh, that was when Gaddafi was alive too. Um, we could sell the ports to Dubai. We were going to do that. Remember that? Okay. Didn't, didn't end up happening. The Bureau of Land Management could sell off land to private developers and raise money that way. Uh, toll roads, some of the toll roads in our country are owned by companies and government entities in China. So when you pay a toll, you're paying it to China <laughs> to go on a U.S. road. Wow, that's crazy. But whatever, it is what it is, right? They could have a yard sale. Okay, what else could they do? Well, they could steal. They could simply use either the military or economic hitmen. I interviewed John Perkins, who's author of a really interesting book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. My mom thinks he's a big hypocrite, which she might be right. But uh, nonetheless, he's written, uh, he wrote another book called A Game as Old as Empire. And uh, John Perkins been on my uh, show before, uh, and um, it's just interesting to know that this goes on. That's what's interesting about John Perkins. And uh, what, what he 
uh, talks about is how he was a government contractor uh, hired years ago to go in and negotiate in quotes. Oh, by the way, folks, I got to I got to pause and ask you a favor. I got to ask you a favor. Favor time. Go hit the like button. Wherever you are watching this, like, like, like. I can tell if you're doing that too, by the way. Go smash the like button. I know you're watching, folks. Okay, I'm going to wait. Wait till you hit the like button. Like, 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 like. Yep, hit the like button. It, it helps those evil algor algorithms that are controlled by the tech, uh, t the tech tyrants uh, make sure that my videos get ranked well. So I appreciate you hitting the like button. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So John Perkins, yeah, he's written these interesting books. And basically uh, what they do is, you know, the U.S. will go in and, and use its negotiating leverage to negotiate favorable deals. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what anybody does, right? Of course they do. They throw their weight around. You know, I don't know why uh, Perkins should be so critical of the U.S. I mean, any country is going to throw around whatever weight they have or any corporation or any individual, right? You know, you that's how you negotiate from whatever things you bring to the table. You use them in the negotiation, you know. But anyway, he makes it seem like that's some evil thing. But the fact is, there are these economic hitmen, if you will, who go negotiate deals and they, you know, steal in essence, because sometimes they get on the better side of the negotiation uh, or the military. I mean, look, one of the most famous military leaders of all time, who was that? Napoleon, the short guy, right? Napoleon syndrome, right? Short man complex, right? Uh, by, by the way, you know, I was saying this yesterday, you know, uh, there's all these like equal rights groups out there and, and groups, uh, you know, protesting for equality and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know why there isn't a group for my people, right? Look, I'm 5'11", okay? So I'm I'm not tall, but I'm not short. I'm just like right in the middle, okay? Um, I guess I'm tall enough. But but the fact is that all of the recent U.S. presidents are, are over six feet. And this is just not fair that I don't have access to the things that someone who's a couple inches taller than me would have. So, you know, what about, why isn't there a group for 5'11 people? Yeah, really. I mean, you know, that's, an, that's what they call an immutable characteristic. So, you know, we have these protected classes of people based on, um, uh, um, ugh, I can't even say it, immutable characteristics Okay. In other words, something you can't change, right? You can't change your, your height. You can't change your age or your race or, you know, whatever, right? Maybe you can't change your preferences. Uh, you know, that was up for debate a while ago, but not so much anymore. Uh, so, so, you know, these are immutable characteristics, right? You can't change. Well, you, I guess you could change your religion, but that's a protected class too. Right. And, um, uh, so, you know, I can't change my height. So why isn't there like a protected class for all of us people my height? And why isn't there a protected class for people that are 6'5"? Because they're so tall, they're kind of like too tall, right? You know, and, you know, they it's hard to relate to people when you're so much taller than them, right? You know, you're always slumping over uh, to try and talk to people. Well, nowadays you're not doing anything because you're wearing a mask and you don't talk to anybody anymore. But yeah, you know, protected class. Think about that. Okay, anyway, so we could steal. All right. Well, what's the here's the good thing, right? This would be the good one. Technological innovation, right? Um, the hopeful areas of progress are obviously biotech, nanotech, energy, right? These are really hopeful areas. Another one that's really interesting, you know, I, I have another podcast called The Longevity and Biohacking Show. And longevity sciences are getting pretty interesting. And I just want you to think about this for a moment. This is a big deal, not because you could be immortal and live longer. Maybe you want to, maybe you don't, okay? But um, it's because it has profound impacts on society and government and spending and inflation. Because think about it. If suddenly the population gets a lot older and people live a lot longer and they need government aid for much more time, 
what does that do to the debt clock? Well, it it's, means more debt, okay? A lot more debt. And that means a lot more inflationary pressure. Remember, more debt, uh, not necessarily instantly, but over the long term, more debt means more inflation. And more inflation means more benefits for smart real estate investors following my plan, using my trademark idea of inflation-induced debt destruction. That is a great thing for us because we are going to align our interests with the most powerful forces the human race has ever known, governments, central banks, okay? So technological innovation is a good thing. And if that's an Amer uh, America-centric innovation, then it'll make the country population richer. So that'll be a benefit to help us get out of the debt mess that we're in. But the most likely one is this one, inflation. Inflating our way out of the debt is the most likely, and it's, it's not even likely, it's already happening, it's been happening for decades. So it is a part of, well, I say, it's a part of the business plan of the two most powerful entities the human race has ever known, governments and central banks, okay? And so they will inflate more, they have an incentive to inflate more, and that will only benefit us as real estate investors dramatically, dramatically benefit us. So uh, very, very important to align your interest with these powers. Now, if you don't know how to do this, if you're new to my work, uh, number one, be sure you're listening to the Creating Wealth podcast, because I'll teach you a lot more about that. Um, when we announce our next uh, virtual event, our Creating Wealth event that we're going to announce soon, be sure to attend that. It'll be so easy to attend. You'll just jump on Zoom with us. And, you know, we do it meeting style where everybody gets to participate. We don't do it like one to many. Um, you know, it's not a speech, it's a workshop. So you really can be in, engaged and involved, get all your questions answered. And so that'll be coming up. Look for that announcement, okay? And um, as far as the time for our future live streams uh, with George and such, um, uh, let me think about that and we'll see what we're going to do there because we have a lot of overlap in our audiences. So maybe we'll push ours back an hour or or something like that. I'm not sure yet. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, John says... Yeah, well, you know, we're still talking about the gold back currency thing. And, um, you know, listen, I, uh, it is what it is. What can I tell you? Uh, I don't run the world, unfortunately, so I can't make it the way I want it. <laughs> you know, all I want to do is align my interests with these powerful forces. Okay. Uh, in the past, uh, free market with innovation uh, meant the dollar to get cheaper. Government wants inflation, which devalues the dollar. What's really wrong with no inflation or deflation? Well, what's wrong with um, especially deflation, no, no inflation is kind of in between, but what's wrong with deflation is this, Mark, uh, uh, and deflation is the, the scariest of all economic um, maladies. Why? Why is it the worst? It is the worst because it reduces the velocity of money and it causes people to postpone purchases. Uh, when you're in a deflationary environment, you get uh, people putting off purchases because they'll be cheaper tomorrow than they are today. So they'll wait, wait, wait. And if that spending stops and that velocity of money stops, it's this downward spiral that is really, really bad for an economy. Remember, all economies are built on consumption and spending. And if you don't have that, um, you got problems. So they have a very, uh, a very uh, big interest in causing inflation. In fact, it's not like a theory. It's the Fed's stated goal of 2% inflation. Actually, recently they, they walked that back. And our rich uncle Jerome Powell, <laughs> chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, basically said, we're not even going with a 2% target anymore, which means they are really dovish when it comes to inflation. They're just going to let inflation run. They don't care. And the way they're printing money lately shows that they don't care. So we'll see. Okay. Uh, and Mary, uh, this is kind of just uh, kidding, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, or live in your car <laughs> in a cyclical market and then own properties in linear markets. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Okay. Bryant says, 
How do you feel about doing a reverse mortgage in a cyclical market and investing that money in a linear market? Uh, that is a great question, Bryant. Thank you for asking that one. That's a really good question. Um, conceptually, I like the idea of reverse mortgages. However, that um, industry is not very well, uh, it's, it just hasn't matured yet and figured itself out. And um, be careful. Some of these reverse mortgages contain some really risky provisions in them. So, uh, you know, there's been, a, there's been a lot of litigation over reverse mortgages. There have been some calls for more regulation and so forth. Uh, I, I don't know where that industry is now, but my thinking is, uh, just anecdotally here, is that uh, reverse mortgages, conceptually, I think it's a good idea. I think it's fine as, an, as a concept. But in practice, I don't know. You got to really look at the terms of that reverse mortgage. Make sure you read the loan docs really, really well and uh, make sure you know what you're getting into, okay? Or you know what your parents are getting into. Reverse mortgages are generally used by older people. Um, so just be careful, you know, caveat emptor, right? Buyer beware. Okay, eccentric. Uh, people who shorted the housing market back and do, doing it again, what are your thoughts? I think it's way too early to be shorting the housing market. I think... Um, now look at the housing market is made up of a lot of markets, over 400 uh, MSAs, over 3,000 counties. There is no national housing market in the US, so I can't answer that question easily. But what I would say is that suburban linear markets that we recommend that you'll find at jasonhartman.com in the property section, those have a lot of juice left in them, a lot of steam in those markets for at least two or three years. I think I'm very bullish on those markets right now. There is a, a major structural shortage of housing, especially in those low density suburban linear markets that we have been recommending for 16 years. Okay. So I think you're okay. Uh, you know, I would short New York City and LA and uh, and Seattle, well, downtown Seattle, uh, not the rest of Seattle necessarily. Uh, I'd short downtown San Francisco and I'd short, uh, you know, Boston and, um, you know, some of those types of markets, uh, but I would not short the markets we recommend. I, I'm, I'm very bullish on them. Okay. Um, John says, as with AI, probability destroy. Yes, John, I'm a little worried about your uh, worrying about all this destruction. You be, need to be listening to my holistic survival show. <laughs> but uh, listen, look at there. These these kinds of worries that you have, um, yes, they are um, they are worrisome. I completely agree with you. Um, but just remember, every generation has had their share of worries in their day. OK, you know, when the sewing machine was invented by who was that? I think Elias Howe. You know what they worried about? The big worry back then was. When the sewing machine was invented, people were freaked out, worrying, saying, what will all these women do in their spare time? Hmm. <laughs> I think they figured it out. Okay. Uh, you know, they're always worried that automation will put everybody out of a job and there's always an adjustment period to everything. Yes. AI could take over the human race. Elon Musk says he's very scared of it, but look at, I, I don't, there's nothing I can do about that. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to come and we're going to have to deal with it. Every generation has its challenges, its fears, its concerns, and it's, it's great things too. Uh, it's just the way it is, you know. But uh, if you look at history, if you're a student of history, you'll see that there have always been worries about economic collapse, pollution, uh, this, that, and the other thing, technology, everything. Okay, it's it's just always there. And uh, thank you, John, for putting this up about Elon. Okay, quote from Elon, AI is much more potent than nuclear bombs. Maybe, maybe, but nuclear bombs, if you think about it, really haven't done that much, much damage, okay? Uh, oh, that's good news. So if we start at 7 p.m., we're good. You can just, you, we got your whole Sunday night planned for you, folks, okay? With uh, two live streams, George and then me, back to back. All right, that'll be good. Uh, okay, so 
Um, yeah. Will not be yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, look at, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about this stuff, but do listen to my holistic survival podcast, okay? Um, there's totalitarian hell. I think we're kind of already here. Okay, Mary says, Jason, mass immigration to the USA is inevitable, a la Europe. How will that affect uh, real estate stateside? It's great. We're <laughs> real estate stateside is um, in the good in the good linear suburban markets that we recommend. Very bullish. So go to our website. Listen to the Alabama webinar. Okay, JasonHartman.com/sweethome. Check that out right after this. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up here in a moment. Right after this, you need to listen to uh, MMT is CBDC. So the banks will want it soon. Um, well, modern monetary theory um, is not a uh, workable concept, if you ask me. But yes, I know a lot of people want it. And uh, we'll see. I don't know. Fedcoin won't be in 2021, says Bill. The amount of currency has already been determined. Okay, well, when will it come? When are we going to see Fedcoin or whatever it's going to be called? That's not necessarily the name of it. But yes, we are going to have a digital government and central bank sponsored currency. Paul, how will the government set the value of digital coin? I don't know. It's not going to be good for us though. That's for sure. Well, I think most people, Nick, will be brainwashed and some will reject it. The smart people will want to reject it and the rest will be the brainwashed sheep. And, um, you know, it is what it is. Okay. Uh, It'll be attached to the dollar, controlled by the Fred, Fed. Yeah, they'll take the paper currency out of circulation and, and it'll turn into digital currency. So yeah, that's the way it is. Okay, Mark says the debt clock even shows the true value of gold and silver in the lower right. Yes, that's fascinating. But remember, gold and silver prices are manipulated. Check out GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. And um, you know the Federal Reserve considers uh, gold. I mean, Alan Greenspan even called it a barbarous relic. Remember that, and uh, they consider it a uh, a competitor for their widget, their currency. So they don't want to see gold and silver go up and have everybody, uh, you know, move move their dollars and convert them into gold and silver. Okay, so uh, yeah. Um, Mary says, "What do I think of the lockdown in California? I think it's ridiculous, and I think." Uh, California is a totalitarian state. I'm glad I don't live there. It's a disaster. And uh, if you can, you should move. That's what I think. California is pathetic. It's it's an absolute mess. And it's so sad because it's such a beautiful state. And it's my home state. I mean, I spent the vast majority of my life in California. I wish it wasn't so, okay? I, I wish it wasn't so. Or I wish it weren't so. What's the proper grammar? Where's my mom here to correct me? My mom usually watches the live stream. Correct me on that one, mom. Okay. Uh, Nazik says, is it, is it live or is it Memorex? Do you realize how old that ad is? Yes, I do realize how old that ad is. It's, uh, remember, I, I grew up in the era of cassette tapes. Uh, so, yeah. Good eye for that. Okay, thanks. Uh, will there be a war of global currency? Yeah, there's going to be more wars. Look at, like I've always said, as long as war is profitable, there will never be peace. Governments and central banks have found a way, especially central banks, to profit from war, from destroying people, destroying things, destroying lives, destroying buildings. And uh, as long as as long as war is profitable, there will never be peace, sadly. So that's the world we live in. And with that optimistic note, folks, I think I'm going to wrap it up because I need to have a salad and I need to walk the dog. So I want to say thank you all for joining me today. Be sure to check out our jasonhartman.com slash sweet home webinar. And if you want the estate planning, tax reducing, and asset protecting webinar, that one is jasonhartman.com slash protect. And we will see you on those. And I want to say have a good day, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate uh, talking to you. And next Sunday, we will be on at a different time. Remember, what's the new time, folks? Well, currently, it's 4 o'clock Pacific and 7 o'clock Eastern next Sunday. New time, new time next Sunday. See you then.